arguably one of the best hallmarks of a great friendship is all the new media that they can introduce you to. In the last few years, I have been introduced to many different shows, animes, movies, and albums that I wouldn't otherwise have touched. All thanks to weekly hangouts with friends over Discord. One such friend actually introduced me to MASH, which I have no clue how the hell I lived without my entire life, and it was quite kind of her considering I tortured her with a ruby first. Why are you eating this scum? But it's okay, cause I made up for that by introducing her to Avatar. And I think seeing someone with no context fall in love with Avatar, it really shows you just how perfect it is on nearly every front. We recently started The Legend of Korra and... Look, I've said it before, Korra's a mess, but she is my mess. I still think it's an overall good series who is forever doomed to suffer in the shadow of Avatar. But that said, that doesn't mean we need to sweep its problems under the rug. Book one has usually been regarded as one of the stronger seasons, albeit with a raging garbage fire for a finale. And yeah, that hasn't really changed much. Weirdly, in some areas, book one has actually proven better than I remember. But in others, um, <laughs> why hello there, proto white fang. I hope you're not advocating for equal rights too hard. The revolution has begun. So today we're going to revisit book one and go section by section with how I feel about it now based upon different aspects of the show. How has this season aged? And before y'all scream, yes, we're taking into account that the creators did not know they would be getting any additional seasons after this one, which honestly makes me resent that finale even more. Like, did y'all... I... You're telling me this wasn't a first draft? I... Oh, good God. Y'all thought this was going to be your series finale and you didn't think to rearrange things to make it less... that. Before we begin... Ciao! My name's Thomas, aka the Unicorn of War, and I make videos about whatever the fuck I want to. I know I know it's the beginning of the video, I can't curse. About whatever media I like. And talk about what elements resonate with me and which ones don't. If that sounds enjoyable to you, then you can subscribe and ring that bell for notifications because YouTube hates creators. Also, please consider supporting myself in the channel over on Patreon, where you can receive extra rewards such as early access videos and scripts, Patreon exclusive content, and access to the private Union of War Discord server. Now, without further ado, let the chaos commence. Korra has often been divisive among audiences. Some folks adore her, while others are lining up to call her the worst Avatar they've ever seen. Which, really guys? Worse than Avatar failed to stop Sozin and Roku? Worse than Avatar lost my wife to the face dealer Korok? And I know y'all stand Kiyoshi, I do too, but y'all know she made the Dai Li too, right? Nobody's perfect. That said, the goal with Korra for the writers was to make her a total 180 from Aang where Aang was evasive, diplomatic, avoided his problems like the plague, and had a spine made out of jelly, Korra is hot-headed, assertive, aggressive, and impulsive as all hell, always ready to handle a problem head-on rather than dance around it. She's strong. She lacks restraint. Korra tends to get called a Mary Sue by certain sects of fandom, which, let's be real, just means a female character I don't like because she's not demure enough. Like, she is flawed, and the narrative acknowledges those flaws. Like her lack of patience, her inability to think things through. That was a 2,000-year-old historical treasure! What is wrong with you?! And her lack of social skills due to being locked away in a goddamn compound all her life. Which, weirdly, is an aspect they didn't actually interrogate until next season. Every avatar before you traveled the world to learn. It was Tenzin and your father who kept you secluded at the South Pole. I thought Aang ordered the White Lotus to keep me down here. Okay. I have my issues with how the narrative handles some of those flaws, specifically localized to book one, but we'll get there later. But I was surprised on rewatch to find Korra a lot more mature than I remember her being. She means well in trying to help people as the Avatar, even if it gets her into trouble with the law. Which, oh dear, we need to unpack the copaganda too. Even when it comes to the godforsaken Bermuda love triangle, she's still willing to apologize for her part in messes, whether it be for hurting Bolin's feelings. I'm sorry I hurt your feelings. I didn't mean to let things get so out of hand. But we had fun together, didn't we? I had a great time, honestly. 
You are one of a kind, Olin. Or being kind to Asami while she's dating Mako and going through the ringer. Maybe you don't know everything about your father. I'm sorry. Does your offer to live at the Air Temple still stand? Of course it does. And Asami's welcome too. After everything she's been through, she's going to need you, Mako. There's even the willingness to apologize for her brashness when she gets frustrated by Tenzin's teachings and going behind his back. Tenzin had his issues too, and I genuinely love the mentor-student relationship between these two, where they are both learning from each other. It's one of the most wholesome things I've ever seen. I'm really sorry. I was really frustrated with myself, and I took it out on you. I think I owe you an apology too. I was trying to teach you about patience, but I lost mine. Oh, and as yikesy and neoliberal as the show's handling on politics is, and how that seeps into Korra's dismissal of the Equalist movement because the narrative itself dismisses them immediately, we do get to see glimpses of Korra seeing the actual problems when Tarlock goes off the rails. You need to turn the power back on and leave these people alone. You don't have the right to treat these innocent people like criminals. When he turns off the power for non-benders and the police are actively, wrongfully arresting loads of them, Korra steps in to get them out of Dodge, and then later confronts Tarlock to tell him off to try and get him to stop. It's genuinely baffling that people read this disrespect for authority as haughty and self-righteous, because isn't that what Aang was doing in the last show? Standing against an unjust authority that was hurting people. That's kind of the whole point. The only difference here is that because the status quo just seems less evil on the surface, it is assumed to be inherently good and just, when it is the furthest thing from. Granted, the narrative itself isn't very interested in questioning these institutions, but I do live for Korra telling them off when they're either failing the people or outright hurting and oppressing them. I need more of this, Korra, please. An avatar who is truly for the people, not the state and its branches. The real problem comes in Korra's arc of learning airbending, which leads us into... The elements have kinda lost a lot of their philosophical and thematic purpose. Like, you know how Aang learning earthbending was a proxy for growing his spine, or how learning firebending was him no longer running from responsibility? Korra's relationship with the elements is not quite as elegant. Yes, Korra's inability to airbend, at a glance, is about learning the virtue of patience, learning to find different ways to solve her problems instead of the gung-ho, guns-blazing attitude that allowed her to take so well to fire and earthbending. But it's not enough for a narrative to tell you what its theme is, or what an arc is. It has to actually walk the walk. And with Korra, that doesn't really happen. Korra's inability to airbend being connected to this lack of patience is never actually interrogated. We talk a lot about her lack of spiritual aptitude, but we don't actually explore it the way that we explored Aang's issues when it came to learning new bending styles. And I would suspect a lot of this, besides the general corrosion of bending as a means of understanding oneself in relation to the world, comes from the fact that we can't pause the story to let the characters breathe. With shorter seasons focused solely on the main plot, we lose the ability to have filler episodes, or even episodes that are just dedicated to one thing. Look at how many Avatar episodes focused on specific relationships between characters, or how Aang had a whole episode just about learning earthbending. Korra can't do the same thing, because Korra only has 12 episodes to fight the Equalists, and we cannot waste a single one that isn't trying to accomplish a dozen things in 20 minutes. So the whole airbending training thing takes a backseat to fighting the Equalists. I'm not even sure why this book is called Air, because honestly, book three does more for the element of air than book one does. Even thematically, with the anti-bending revolution going on, and themes of the powerful versus the powerless, all the philosophies of airbending have nothing to do with any of this. And in the end, Korra can only airbend when Amon selectively takes away her water, fire, and earthbending. Which... How? They never explain how this bloodbending stuff works, and without clear, consistent rules, you're kind of just left to guess how it works, which gives the writers wiggle room for a lot of bullshit. He somehow uses bloodbending to take people's bending. I don't know how he does it. It makes anything to do with this element cheap. I swear that wasn't a pun. Like, how did Amon manage to take only three elements from Korra, but not air? 
Is it because she had no connection to Air beforehand? I shouldn't have to be guessing this. Little quality of life things like this, establishing consistent rules ahead of time, were always considerations back in Avatar. So when they are absent in Korra, they add little road bumps that you may not notice at first, but you absolutely feel. And that shit adds up very quickly. And the fact that Korra got her air bending through force of will. I can air bend? I can air bend! That she air punches Amon because it's all she has left. Yeah, it's not cathartic or satisfying. Because she didn't have to learn to be a new person in order to learn air, she and the narrative forced the element to work for her. Like, imagine if Aang didn't have to become assertive to learn earth or fire, but instead found a way to learn them while remaining his avoidant self. And yes, Korra does become a more patient and mature person across later seasons. It is a journey I love, and thusly her airbending improves. But we're talking about book one in isolation. And even when it comes to book two, the air punches are never really portrayed as a problem for her. I have mastered airbending. Punch, punch, punch! She never has to acknowledge the fact that she took a shortcut to learning air that circumvented character development. She just eventually learns air as a side effect of becoming wiser. Yeah, that's, uh, it's not really all that compelling. Yeah, this is the easiest thing to dunk on, and I think the most unpopular thing in the whole show. And while the mess has grown on me, I have to admit it's still not the best thing ever. Like, it's fun to revel in just how nonsensical and stupid all of this is, especially as characters focus more on their romantic woes than the wanton destruction and carnage around them. Why don't you sit in back? with Korra. But it kind of reinfirms that these writers have never been all that great at writing romance. Romance has always been the weakest aspect of Avatar to me. The original series suffered a lot from the societal expectations that are baked into all of us. That everyone is straight by default, that everyone must get with their one true soulmate of the opposite sex, and they must have a monogamous relationship with 3.5 children. Granted, a lot of characters like Sokka didn't, but that's less a thing that we talk about and acknowledge, and more a thing the show uses to just discard their entire existence like they don't matter. Like, what, what happened to Sokka? What was his life like? I, come on, guys. So the romance in Korra is a mess. On the one hand, part of me kind of likes that, because Korra has been locked away for so long, she's never had the chance to make friends her own age and socialize, let alone develop and explore crushes. Gay folks kind of have something similar. We're not really given the freedom or safety to explore cutesy relationships like the straights early on, so all of our messy milestones wind up happening in either early or late adulthood, and Korra is a similar case. So Korra developing this crush on Mako and going, The first pretty broody boy I see must be my one true love. I, I don't mind that. But like, all the praise that this show gets for letting Korra and Mako break up halfway through how it breaks this ridiculous convention of your first being your one and only, that's only because they realized how bad this relationship was in book two. Remember, book one was the only season that they thought they were gonna get, so this happy ending for Korra and Mako was what they thought was endgame. And that doesn't quite work because I just don't buy their relationship. Like, why are they soulmates? All they do is butt heads and drive each other insane. This is what straight people who hate their partners and have no connection to their own sense of self think love is. And because we have so little time, this subplot takes up way too much oxygen. Not just in the first half, but even the second half, where Asami is reminding you how annoyed she is that Mako likes Korra. Like, I love Asami, but time and place, girl, time and place. All this time that could have been used to get to know the characters on their own is instead dedicated to throwing them into whirlwind messy love triangles. Or love squares. Love pentagons. Can I get to know Mako, Bolin, and Asami as people before you introduce them as potential love interests or roadblocks to the actual love interests? It feels less like all of this is meant to help the characters grow and develop, and more just the writers went... You know, they're young adults. Young adults do romance, right? That's what the kids do. Let's get messy. And sure, that can be fun, but if you were to gut this, you wouldn't be losing all that much in terms of story. It feels like they took two shows with wildly different tones and just stapled them together haphazardly. And let's be real, 
Bolin got robbed. Bolin is the real heartthrob here. He's attractive, he's sweet, he's funny, and he's a dumb dumb. I love dumb dumbs. And you're telling me that nobody recognizes him as partner worthy? He has to suffer through the if we abuse men it's funny shit with Eska next season before he gets an actual love interest? Girl, fuck off. So, this is gonna be a lot to unpack. As a foundation, I recommend this video by Kay and Skittles about the politics of Legend of Korra. I have recommended it before, but it is a great series that discusses how the show's juvenile and lacking understanding of politics harms its storytelling. And for book one, Amon is generally seen to be an analog to communism. Please don't get me demonetized, please. By which I mean what the average Westerner thinks communism is, as told to them by post-Red Scare pop culture. There's a number of reasons why this lens is faulty. For one, bending is an inherent trait. It's not a resource that could be redistributed. When Amon takes someone's bending, he's taking a crucial part of their identity, which is a common sentiment among Westerners towards communism. This makes the narrative less trustworthy in how it reads Amon's ideology. The Equalists routinely posit how they are discriminated against for being non-benders, but the show never truly establishes that. The closest that we get is crime gangs targeting a non-bender shop in the first episode, and the ruling council being composed of all benders. At least, I assume that they're all benders? It's never a thing that gets clarified, which to me demonstrates that the show doesn't understand how systems of oppression and inequality work. The show has no real understanding of systems, only individuals. For example, this approach would view homophobia not as institutions persecuting gay people through policy, leaving them vulnerable to discrimination in housing, marriage, healthcare, etc. Instead, it would view homophobia as individual bigots throwing slurs at them, and the end of homophobia comes not with overhauling this broken system or even replacing it, but with band-aid solutions telling people to just be nicer to gays. Moreover, the entire Equalist movement falls apart when Amon is exposed as a bender. He isn't a man who genuinely believes in his cause, he's a fraud. So we don't actually have to tackle his ideology head on and confront whether or not he may be right. We can just write him off and then be comfy with the status quo as non-benders collectively go, yeah, I guess we don't need rights. Like this isn't how movements work. If Martin Luther King Jr. or Malcolm X were revealed to be frauds in some way, that wouldn't magically mean that the civil rights movement was wrong all along. Even the fact that it feels wild to compare the Equalists to IRL movements for equality kind of shows just how shallow the writer's understanding of these movements are. This is how reactionaries and conservatives talk about things like Black Lives Matter or queer and trans people advocating for their rights in the modern era. People who've gone too far and have become the new oppressors. Have you ever thought about asking for your rights nicely? The show also tries to sweep this all under the rug with the installation of President Raiko. We no longer have a council of people representing the four nations. Instead, we have a democratically elected leader, like America. You exposed Amon as the fraud he was. Equalist movement lost its leader and its power. Free elections were held in the United Republic, and non-benders finally had a voice. Wow, they're really not hiding all the Americana energy, are they? But because he is a non-bender, it means non-benders are gonna be okay. And I can just shut this down with one question. Did Barack Obama's presidency end racism? If you answered yes, seek help. Step outside. <laughs> Once more, I cannot stand the bloodbender twist, practically or thematically. We will start with the basics. Psychic bloodbending is bullshit. What the hell does this even mean? You can just bend by looking at someone? Twitching your eyebrows just right? You could have clapped your hands. You oh. could have winked or brushed oh. your eyelids. <laughs> How does that work? Why does it not require a full moon? When Yakone says that they're a long line of bloodbenders, does that mean that there were psychic bloodbenders before him? Potentially even before the time of Katara and Hama? Who the fuck knows? Because they're not going to tell us. 
No, we don't technically need to know, but the fact that we go until the very end of the show without these answers feels cheap and makes anything and everything to do with the subplot feel cheap by extension. When Avatar had things like seismic sense or even chakras, they would always explain how they worked, not just practically, but in terms of philosophy. Bloodbending does not get the same courtesy, which especially makes Amon's ability to take bending away through bloodbending feel frustrating because how do these things connect? Is it a chi path thing in the body? If so, having characters realize that could provide a realistic, engaging path to regaining bending by reopening those chi paths. What could have made for an interesting story of characters understanding how Amon's abilities work so as to undo the harm he does is just written off as, ooh, spooky bloodbending magic. And that also leads to a deeply unsatisfying ending that we'll get into later. It is just a perfect storm of things that the show refuses to inspect deeper, leading to contrivance after contrivance, all cheapening the overall feel of that finale. And even the fact that Amon is secretly a bender, thus he is a fraud, girl, fuck off. Not only is that not how movements work, that's not how ideology works. You can still be a bender and believe that bending is evil, the same way that you can possess privilege in an unjust system and believe that system must be dismantled. Tarlock has like one line of going, I guess Saman genuinely believes bending is evil, but then never gets interrogated because the show is throwing all of its eggs into the he's a fraud basket. Once again, it gives us a convenient excuse not to ask ourselves if maybe he's got some kind of point about the inequality of the Avatar world. Korra doesn't have to wonder if maybe this system does actually privilege benders over non-benders. She doesn't have to actually engage with Amon's ideas about the world no longer needing benders, no longer needing an avatar. She doesn't even need to think about whether or not the avatar is more than just the ability to bend. There's no battle of ideologies here, just a literal, physical battle that's about as deep as a dried up puddle. Oh, and no, I don't feel bad for Tarlock. We practiced constantly. And I hated every minute of it. I am truly sorry for all that I did to you. Fuck you. Seeing him all, ooh, woo, soft boy in that flashback, it made me nearly blow a gasket. Because this man has been routinely oppressing and attacking people with his political power and his freaky blood bending. He gets no respect from me. Even locked up here in the weird attic prison that Tenzin has for some reason. No, I'm not gonna unpack why Tenzin has this. Like, Noah talk calling Tarlock weak and running away because... Tarlock just asked about their mom? I can run away from him. Forever. What about mom? I was right about you. You are a weakling. Girl, what kind of nonsensical non sequitur is this? It really gives that they wanted Noah Talk to appear sociopathic and monstrous, and they just work backwards from their conclusion, which is why so much of this feels ridiculously contrived and unsatisfying. Even back then, my brother wanted everyone to be treated fairly and equally. And then the murders began. Or even the fact that Amon is the brother of Tarlock, when we were given no indication that Yakon had two sons. I'm Amon's brother. <laughs> like, what does this have to do thematically with anything, aside from going, Ooh, Amon's all freaky and blood bendy. Tarla going, I'm Amon's brother, haunts me to this day. There's no way to take this line seriously. What is this, a telenovela? Oh yeah, I forgot to write this in the script, but that bit where Tenzin and his family fly away on Ugi, and then suddenly they're they're imprisoned by Amon, that shit pisses me off, because like the the airship turned around and they got away safely, and yet they're they're in prison. What? How? They got away. We saw them get away. Like, if this were Avatar, there would have been a little scene in the middle that foreshadowed that Tenzin and the others were still in danger, either as they were flying away, maybe another airship followed, or maybe they have a pit stop somewhere and, you know, a danger approaches that, you know, they're unaware of. And we're just like, oh no, are they okay? See, little things like that make the storytelling so much more cohesive and enjoyable. So you're not just taken out of the moment to go, what the fuck is this bullshit? But Legend of Korra is just like, they got captured off screen. Yeah, I don't have a reason for it. You're not going to get one. Mm -mm. Like, mm, mm. The, the little things like that, little things like that really make the difference between a story that is really engaging and fun to watch in the moment and one that just aggravates you and just makes you want to fucking scream into the void.
So there's been quite a lot of discourse about whether or not this ending is good. You've got people saying Korra got her powers handed back to her with no effort and others going, she has been through enough, leave her alone. There's even a reading that her looking down the cliff is, uh, well, I have to choose my words very carefully because of YouTube's draconian systems. But let's just say it was a thought about jumpstarting the reincarnation cycle. And I do want to respect that reading because Korra does go through a lot of anguish and mental health crises throughout the series and questions her own self-worth when she feels like she can't live up to the title of Avatar. It is very much something people see themselves in, usually people who were considered gifted kids in school, only to be kicked around like a soda can once they grow up by callous systems that ruined their mental health and self-worth for fun and profit. But that all said, it doesn't really erase the fact that Korra does kind of just get her bending back at the last minute through no work on her own. And no, there is no glory in suffering for suffering's sake, and I don't want to romanticize struggle when we should be doing all we can to minimize it in the real world. But in terms of storytelling and fiction, yeah, we kind of need to see characters putting in the work to grow and complete their arcs. Sure, they thought this was going to be the series finale, so there was no time to relearn the elements. And yeah, that would be kind of a tedious, redundant process. They had to restore her bending because they didn't want to potentially leave the show off on a note of her losing three of the four elements. I mean, in some way, it could be fun watching her, you know, relearn and regain the elements, form proper connections with them in book two. Personally, I would love it if she figured out how the elements philosophically connected to her, like if they were all like metaphors for a certain struggle she was dealing with. And once she overcame them, she regained that element, not necessarily relearning them, just like, oh, I completed this step of my character arc, so I get my fire bending back, that sort of thing. But again, they didn't know book two is going to be a thing, so like we got to get them back. But I would argue this cheap solution being the potential series finale is even more egregious. You can just rewrite what you wrote to work better than this. You know that, guys? You, you know that, right? You can rearrange episodes and omit pointless subplots or just better manage your time to allow for more space in the finale to find a better way for Korra to regain our connections to the elements. Like, you, you guys know what, like, a second draft is, right? Because if this wasn't your first draft, um, that concerns me. Okay, so maybe cut all the pointless General Iroh stuff, because, like, genuinely, he is not a character. He's a cameo, and he's one of the worst fucking cameos I've ever seen. And instead, wrap up the Amon stuff in Chapter 11. Then Chapter 12 can spend all of its time focusing on wrapping up loose ends. Maybe Korra does what she did before, and she meditates to connect to Aang, and she therefore initiates reopening her chakras somehow. And yes, just talking about the chakra stuff would have been enough to fix all of this. Have Korra learn how Amon did the bending removal, so that way it feels earned when she learns how to undo it, instead of just vague, oh, it's Avatar magic fixie glow. Aang speedrunned his chakras in one episode, and it surprisingly felt very cathartic and well done. So there's no reason Korra wouldn't be able to do the same thing in a finale episode. You could even include little affirmations of the little lesson she's learned throughout book one. And then not only is she using her magic avatar fixie glow to restore other people's bending, but she is helping those people get more in touch with themselves to do so. Imagine with me Lin having to reopen her chakras to get back in touch with earth and metal bending. It would be so cool. And same for other characters. It would reaffirm the thematic and cultural importance of bending, almost forcing the characters to go beyond the superficial utilitarian use of the elements that they had by default. So, yeah. Clearly, I've got some thoughts on book one, and they're not all great. Overall, I would say it was still enjoyable until those last two episodes. Those were absolute fucking misery. I would happily watch The Spirit of Competition before I ever touched skeletons in the closet. And Endgame might actually be the worst episode of Avatar ever produced. I never want to hear anyone complain about The Great Divide ever again. At least The Great Divide is coherent. Endgame is only good if you just want something so batshit you can make fun of it deeply easily. So maybe there is merit in that. It's baby's first attempt at nuance. It's going to be messy and not great and very yikesy at times. 
But maybe the first step has to be allowed to be messy before you can arrive at greatness. Uh, at least I'm going to keep telling myself that because Jesus Christ. Anyhow, if you enjoyed this video and would like to see more content like this from me, then be sure to subscribe and ring that bell for notifications because YouTube hates creators. And again, please consider supporting myself and the channel over on Patreon so I can continue making these videos for you. I'm the Unicorn of War, and book one is kind of a shit show.